So I'm Linda Kozlowski, I'm the COO of Etsy. And uh, for those of you who are expecting the Australian actress, I'm really sorry. I am not her, but sometimes it does help me get reservations, so it's great. But um, I'm really excited to be here today and talk to you guys about how to scale um, and go global from day one. Um, this is a topic that I'm really passionate about. I've always worked for global companies. And, and I feel like it's, it's a new trend where it's much easier to think about being a global company from the very start. Um, and that's really what we're going to talk about today. But before we get started on that, I want to tell you a little bit about Etsy, just in case you don't know. So for those of you who aren't aware, Etsy is a marketplace for creative entrepreneurs that lets those creative entrepreneurs sell their goods to buyers that are looking for something unique to express their personality. So we're almost 12 years old now and based in Brooklyn, New York. And um, Etsy is a very unique company because in the world of retail, you, you don't often see companies that, um, that are really focused on helping the person who's selling as opposed to person, the person who's buying. So what makes Etsy very different is we have what's called the empowerment loop. And the empowerment loop is really about the fact that we believe that sellers who are making artisan goods and creative goods should be able to make a living wage selling those goods and they shouldn't necessarily have to sacrifice their lifestyle or, or how they want to work um, in order to lower their prices for profit. So we focus a lot on helping our creative entrepreneurs um, develop their products. We provide a technology platform that lets them sell those products at the best possible value to our buyers. And then we facilitate that transaction. We reinvest those dollars back into the, uh, the platform to create more opportunity for those sellers. So really what this means is that the Etsy ecosystem um, survives because we make money when the sellers make money. And by aligning our business model with our sellers' goals, that helps us to always make the right business decisions and really be very conscious about how we're building. And we never wind up making a decision that is, that is against what's best for our sellers because we're, we're aligned in, in what we're trying to do. Now, this is a very simple concept of this idea of creating a business model that really supports, um, supports your customers effectively, but we're not really living in a very simple world. So there's a lot changing in the world right now. There's a lot of global shifts, particularly happening in the US right now. Um, economic situations can change all the time. And this is really one of the reasons you want to think about yourself as a global company as early as possible. Because the more global you are, the more you can actually balance different economic changes and situations as you grow and take opportunities to help your customers ride the waves of different economic change. And this is something that Etsy has been very focused on since day one. And we've made it our, our mission to really not just offer people ability to sell their products within their own country, but we really want people to be able to have access to the global market. So even if you're an individual maker, you should be able to sell your goods anywhere in the world, um, and we should make that as painless as possible for you. So now, what does this actually get us? What this means is Etsy has actually grown to be one of the largest e-commerce companies in the world, um, all based on these individual micro entrepreneurs. So people that are working from home, people that are expressing their creativity. They might be selling full-time, they might be selling part-time, but we now have 1.7 million sellers around the world who are making their own products and able to put them on the Etsy platform and offer them up to more than 27 million buyers. So that creates a significant amount of opportunity when you think about the fact that we now have buyers and sellers in almost every country in the world. But how exactly did we get there? Because Etsy is a much more mature company now, and therefore it's not that unusual to think of the fact that it's a global organization, but the reality is it, it started as a globalization, global organization. From day one, we've had buyers and sellers all over the world, even here in Australia. So what I'm going to talk about today are sort of three different ways that you can prepare your company, no matter how small or how new, um, and think about going global in the future and prepare yourself for that. I'm going to talk about how you can use data to mitigate risk. I'm going to talk about how you can use technology uh, to make it much easier to scale your company globally. And then I'm going to talk about how you can use marketing to reach customers in various parts of the world and feel like a local product. So first, let's talk about data. 
On the data side, this is probably one of the most exciting things about doing business today. If you're doing a digital product, if you're actually building an app or something that's a website or something that's a service that's digital, then you have an advantage. It used to be that in order to think about expanding globally, you basically built your product, and then you sat around and you decided, based on opportunity, what country do we want to go to next? But it was a huge risk. It was something where you sort of had to look at the market opportunity, then shut your eyes and take that leap. And there was a huge amount of investment involved in, in getting into those markets. But you don't actually need to do that anymore. The reality is, if you're selling a digital product, it's highly likely that customers all over the world are going to find that product, whether you mean for them to or not. But what this gives you is this gives you data to understand how likely your opportunity is to succeed. So for example, um, in talking about Etsy, when Etsy launched in 2005, we already had sellers in Australia and New Zealand. By 2010, our seller base in Australia was the fourth largest in the world and growing at 73% a year. We hadn't put anybody into the country yet. There was still just a digital product. So what we were able to do was we were able to look at the number of people and the, and the growth, the number of people who are selling, and the growth in Australia and New Zealand and say, this is an opportunity, and we want to start actually um, taking advantage of this opportunity and building the community on the ground. So in 2011, we put our first uh, person in Australia to help serve that community. But the nice thing about this is because of the data that we had access to and because we could already see usage patterns from, from our customers around the world, we already knew that this was going to be a strong market for us because it was already so big, it had grown organically on its own, and we already had a nice base of both buyers and sellers in country. So it made it much lower risk when we decided to open an office here and start building, uh, building our presence, and it's still one of our top five markets to date. So in thinking about that opportunity, um, there's, it's, you know, it, it can work in multiple ways. So in addition to understanding your own data as far as how your audience is performing and where there's demand for your product, you can then actually match that with market and industry data to understand what the longer term potential is. And Australia has such a unique um, economic situation. It's, it's the ninth highest income base in the world and the 13th largest economy in the world. So there's a significant amount of, um, of income here that helps drive an opportunity for e-commerce growth. In addition to that, 90% of the people in Australia have internet access. Now, admittedly, it's probably not as fast as it should be, but 90% of people here have internet access, which is very high for any country in the world. There's also 3.1 devices per person, which is one of the highest numbers of devices per, per person in the world as well. So these two things together mean you have people with connectivity and you have people with multiple devices, which is far more likely to be a rich source of potential e-commerce traffic. But this last figure, 63% uh, uh, who shop across borders, this is actually very, very unusual. So Australia is a country and a continent that is very, very used to trade and very used to both domestic purchases as well as international um, purchases, both import and export. So this wound up being a very perfect situation for Etsy because our marketplaces are built to let you buy from somebody who's just down the street or buy from somebody who's on the other side of the world. And we give our sellers the opportunity to choose which one they actually want to do. But you can see how the combination of people who had already adopted Etsy um, on the platform before we even had an office here, plus the amazing market opportunity that we saw in Australia gave us a lot of guiding, um, guiding signals into how we can actually build a presence here. So in thinking about data, um, you know, just another opportunity that, uh, that comes to mind is when I was at Evernote, uh, there's, we, we followed a similar pattern. Um, Evernote had 75% of its users outside of the US. Um, and part of that actually really started in Japan, which is an unusual market to enter first. But Evernote, we had a very similar situation. And what happened there was when Evernote launched in 2008, you started to see Japanese usage, even of the English version of the app, picking up very, very quickly. And so as that started to pick up and become popular before we even you know, had any kind of presence in Japan or even had translation for Japan, we were able to see the opportunity and we were able to expand accordingly. 
So then we were able to choose after the fact, let's go ahead and start translating into Japanese and let's build partnerships in Japan. And what that actually led us to was um, by 2012, 9% of the entire population of Japan was using Evernote. So we had that automatic sort of entry point into a highly lucrative, highly growing market that's typically extremely difficult to enter into, but we were able to do it by just watching the data and listening to our customers. So now that we've talked about data a little bit, let's talk a little bit about technology. So when you think about global expansion and you're building a product, a lot of things that you're going to hear from people uh, who are around you are going to say, well, how are you going to change your product for China? How are you going to change your product for Korea? How are you going to change your product for Germany? And so there's this myth out there that the first thing you should do is you should think about a different user interface for your product depending on where you're actually going because every country is different and the cultural norms are different in each country. That is extremely true that cultural norms are different in each country and people like to use products differently. But the reality is your best bet is to make sure that you're building a single global product that is the best experience for most people and to not customize that product based on each market. If you take on the, the task of actually customizing your product for each market, it's going to be impossible to maintain quality because you're constantly trying to maintain all these different versions and sync up features and figure out how to coordinate that around, uh, around the world. And that gets to be very, very burdensome. The reality is there are cultural differences in each market, but there is a baseline of really high quality user interaction with a product that everyone wants to have. So my advice to you is as you're building your product, don't actually think about changing each product for each country. Instead, look at the most requested features for each of your key markets and decide if you want to implement those for the entire world. Oftentimes, those will turn out to be some of your best features, even though you didn't necessarily know they were going to need to be in one specific market. An example is it's very popular in China to use phone number registration for logging onto an app, but not as popular in the United States. However, if you build phone number registration into your app, it's highly likely that it will be used across Europe, and eventually it will actually be used in the US as well. So you can really balance, um, balance those different areas. That being said, while you don't necessarily want to uh, build different products, you do need to think about how you can actually make your product as local as possible using technology. So as an example, the product itself won't change, but you do need to localize. Language is extremely important. And localization can be very, very challenging. Localization is a particular challenge for Etsy because we have 40 million product listings. And a lot of those product listings, because they're unique, either vintage or handmade goods, um, change on a regular basis. So there's not an ongoing you know, stock of those items. They're one off and they change constantly. So what we've done is we've employed machine translation um, across 10 different languages to make sure that you always see something that's in your local language, even if the person who actually listed the item wasn't listing it in your language. And this also increases your globalization. Now, as, as the world sort of expands and grows, you're seeing machine translation get much, much better with each passing week. So taking advantage of machine translation to do a lot of the heavy lifting of translation for you is a great way to simplify your product development, but then also uh, get to a point where you can have a significant amount of scale globally. In addition to localization, payments are the other thing that you'll need to invest in if you're thinking about um, growing globally. Different currencies and different payment methods are extremely important to getting people to pay for your product. So for example, at Evernote, when we started using Japanese yen um, in Japan for pricing, we increased our revenue up from Japan by 20%. And this was mainly because there was such a difference in recognizing dollars versus uh, yen that it, people couldn't compute it in their mind um, and couldn't necessarily understand the difference. Now, however, in Europe, it was a much different story. Because in Europe, the euro pricing is not that far off from the US dollar pricing. And so therefore, we didn't see quite as much of an uplift when it came to, uh, when it came to actually changing into local currency because it was easier for people to, to make the translation in their head. However, when we started introducing bank transfer as far as a payment method, then we saw a big spike in Europe because there's a preference to pay with bank transfer. 
So you need to think both about currency and about payment methods um, in order to think about localization effectively. That being said, one of the easiest tools to use if you are selling an app, um, all the app stores offer multiple currency payments. So you can easily, if you're using, you know, if you're using Apple's, um, Apple's App Store or if you're using Google Play, then it's going to be much easier for you to actually customize your currency based by market because they'll actually do it for you. Um, but most companies still supplement with their own website downloads and, and those sorts of things, and so you need to make sure that your currencies match up. It's also important to understand the difference between credit cards because some credit cards are single issue versus double issue. So depending on wh which country, it's much more common to have single issue credit cards that cannot be used for US dollars. So a lot of payment sites will actually offer you the chance to say, you can show your price in local currency, but we're actually going to process it in your, in, in your currency. And that can get people into trouble because the user is seeing their currency, but they don't actually know that it's not going to work with their credit card because on the back end it's being translated into Australian or US dollars. So then um, the, the last thing I want to talk about is really thinking about, um, about how you can think about marketing. Um, actually, sorry, before I talk about marketing, I just want to touch on one more bit of technology that's really helpful for some of you. The other thing that you can use to localize is APIs. So if you have an application, you should really seriously consider opening up your API uh, because you can actually use that to create some of that customization I was talking about before. So again, going back to Evernote, it was the same product the world over. We didn't change the product for different countries. However, we had a fully open API. And through that API, third-party developers in each one of those countries could actually develop on top of Evernote and create the customized functionality that you might want to have that you wouldn't want to invest in building yourself. So that can dramatically increase your user base because as people are actually using that API to build these customized applications on top of it, then you get a lot more reach and it's not necessarily something that you're paying extra money for. So really consider if you're thinking about going global, making sure from a very early time that your API is open. It's a great way to get traffic and the people who build on top of your application will also market on your behalf. It's also really helpful to have an open API if you're forming um, partnerships with either carriers or device, um, device companies around the world. So then lastly, let's talk about marketing. So marketing is the area where you should completely and totally localize. So if you've built your product as a single product the world over, and you've focused on keeping your technology strong, your product really good, and everybody's having the same experience, then where you can actually have a lot more fun when you think about global expansion is in your marketing. So here in Australia, we've, um, we've done a variety of marketing campaigns, some of which have been global and some of which have been, have been local, but this is one that I think is particularly interesting. So this is really um, City to Outback. So this is really an exploration of where all the Etsy sellers are. So, it's very easy when you're looking at your customer base to focus on the large cities and really just focus on people that are um, within immediate reach of you in Melbourne or in Sydney or, or wherever you happen to be based. But the reality is some of your best customers are going to be kind of in the far corners, in the smaller towns. And, um, and there, there's really a breadth and depth of types of sellers that we have on the Etsy platform, and it's probably going to be true of your customers as well. But this is particularly acute here in Australia because the, the terrain and the diversity of the country is completely different. So the difference between the outback and, and the big cities is really vast, but at the same time, there are creative entrepreneurs in all corners of the country. And how do we actually demonstrate that no matter where you are, you can, sh you can actually have a life that you want to live and you can actually establish your, your sort of creative voice? So this campaign was developed to really show the variety of people, whether they live in a city or whether they live further out, and how they got their creative inspiration and how they're actually selling their product. So this is something that we did that's very, very specific to Australia, but was able to build a much stronger direct connection to the users here um, than a campaign that, you know, a similar campaign would have worked in Germany. So on the localized side, this is an example of a very highly localized um, product. But then you have the global campaigns. And what do you do with those? So again, I mentioned that Etsy is almost 12 years old, but the shocking piece of news is that we only did our first brand campaign last year. So Etsy's never had a brand campaign before. We grew entirely based off of word of mouth. 
um, and some direct marketing and paid marketing. So it's very unusual for a company that's this old to actually never have done any branding campaigns. But we wanted to start introducing this concept because as we continue to expand uh, beyond those 27 million buyers, we really need to make sure that everyone understands the breadth and depth of everyday products that are available on Etsy. Particularly, pe people think of Etsy as a place where you go to buy gifts or you go to plan your wedding. But the reality is, what me most people come to Etsy for is something that's unique and expresses their personality. So how do we explain to more people that it's a place where you can buy everyday items, that you're buying from an individual and you're from a human being, um, and so you, you really can express your personality through everything you buy, not just for special occasions? So the campaign is called Difference Makes Us. So Difference Makes Us is this concept of difference is what makes us Etsy. So the fact that we're all different is really the, the magical part of what makes us all individuals and people. But the fact that we're all different is what makes Etsy the right platform, because you can find something for every type of person on that platform. And it's meant to be a message of both um, you know, what you can actually purchase on the platform, and it's also meant to be a message that supports our values of diversity and inclusion. So we launched this campaign in October, and we decided to make it a very global campaign, where we really took the same core concept of difference makes us, and actually shared it around the world. And here in Australia, we actually, or sorry, um, in the UK, we did a pop-up shop that actually, um, that actually sh highlighted the different products that were featured in the campaign and really showed how different ones could be factored into your everyday life. And then around the world, we also did something called Etsy Made Local, which we've done here in Australia as well. This is one from Canada, where we invite all the different sellers to come together and show their products in person, and really get that expression of the variety of products that you can find on Etsy. And this was an extremely successful campaign, and we're continuing to do it now. It's, it's only three months old, but we're continuing to evolve the campaign overall. But what's been really unique about this is we've been able to take the same core concept and translate it into a variety of different events around the world. So for example, in Australia, the Etsy made local event that was tied to Difference Makes Us um, really actually had, we've had almost 65,000 sellers throughout, um, throughout Australia over time participate in Etsy Made Local, and we were able to sort of extend those, those same sellers into the brand campaign and, and really bring that message home and tie it all together. So branding in general is a nice mix of very local um, items and then very global campaigns as well. And this is a great way that you can sort of build that personal and localized feel on top of a global product. So in summary, I just wanted to kind of go back on the, on the sort of three things that you actually can do going forward. So first of all, when you're thinking about building your first product or you're building the prototype for your product, please decide early on that you should be ready for global expansion. Because the reality is, even if you think you're only going to be selling in Australia to begin with, People are going to find you outside of Australia, and you're probably going to go global earlier than you think. So choose a product category that eventually can expand when you're ready to go global. Secondly, pay attention to your data and make sure that you're actually focused on where people are picking up your products and how they're using it, and that will guide you into a lower risk way to expand globally. Then you should make sure that you're using technology wherever possible to turn the experience into a localized experience without necessarily putting added uh, added resources towards that. And then finally, it's really about taking all of your energy on localization to the marketing and making it feel and making it connect with the local audience. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. If you have any questions.